It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Questions for the uh, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister, when I asked the uh, Premier whether you were intending, uh, whether your government was intending on introducing a carbon tax like they have in Quebec, I really didn't get an answer last Thursday. Uh, she skated all over the place. She was as slippery as the ice outside. Um, let me just tell you what's going on in Quebec. Uh, starting in, uh, on January 1, uh, 2015, so a little over a month from now, drivers in Quebec will pay an extra 1.9 cents on each litre of gasoline for their carbon tax, brand new tax. That's uh, with carbon currently priced at uh, $11.39 per tonne. Drivers will pay two and a half cents more per litre of gas if carbon goes up to $15, six cents if carbon goes up to $30 per tonne, and 10 cents more per litre if carbon goes up to $50 per tonne, which it very well could. Question. Carbon tax will also apply to natural gas and oil as well. Wow. Uh, Minister, are you planning on doing the same thing to hard-working Ontarians? The Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I think first, the first thing we have to understand, Mr. Speaker, is our planet right now is heading for a four degrees Celsius mean temperature change in the last half of this century. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, what that means for my four-year-old grandson the chances of him growing up uh, and getting to my age and have, having a functional economy or having a secure food supply is remote. We're in three, three years of drought in California that is going to drive food prices through the roof for working Ontario families. And as you may know, as a result of climate change, Tim Hortons just raised its coffee prices 10 cents a cup. Climate change is worth making the world a more dangerous and expensive place, and we are still waiting for the opposition to explain what their policy on climate change is, Mr. Speaker. Very nice to know. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I suspect this is more of a tax grab than it is uh, a move to uh, save the uh, environment and save the climate, Mr. Speaker. Um, in fact, in Quebec, the uh, carbon tax that will come in in just over a month will bring in $500 million by, in the first year alone, 2015, and by 2020, it's expected to bring in $3.5 billion in extra taxes. The $500 million is exactly what we found out you were short in uh, this year's uh, fall economic statement. Uh, everything points to, including the meetings and the deals that were signed on Friday between uh, Premier Coulard and Premier Wynne, Everything points to the fact that you're going after a tax grab. Do you really think that two cents a litre in gasoline is going to save the climate? I think what it's going to do is drive jobs out of the economy. Question. It's going to once again overtax the people of Ontario, and it's penalizing hard work on Ontario families. That's what it's going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. So what's your question? Mr. Speaker, first of all, the only carbon tax in Canada is in British Columbia. Second of all, Alberta, the Conservative Party, introduced a credit similar cap-and-trade system to what Quebec and many other jurisdictions have. I would suggest that the honourable member start to understand the difference between a market mechanism that helps companies pool capital and get rewarded for reducing their carbon emissions and improving their productivity and that of a tax. It's very clear to me that the literacy level about fiscal policy and the environment is about zero. So I spent two days with, I spent two days with Resolute Forestry Products going from where they cut down the tree to talking about them, how they're operating in the Quebec system. Some companies like it, some don't, but it's Answer. very clear, Mr. Speaker, the opposition has not even a nodding acquaintance with, a with either climate change or the market mechanisms available in some jurisdictions. Final supplementary. You know, Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. I'd say to the minister, rather than lecturing us, why don't you look in the mirror and test yourself for honesty? You didn't run on the carbon tax. I, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw, please. Withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Member from Timmins, James Bay, to resist the temptation. Minister, Minister, there was no mention of the carbon tax uh, or a cap and trade system in your last election or the, or the Liberal platform. There was none in the throne speech, nor the budget, nor the fall economic statement. This thing's come clearly out of out of left we field. Will not raise taxes. First of all, apologize to the people of Ontario for even thinking of this, and secondly, tell us today that you're not going to do it. Minister. So, 
Mr. Speaker, when government announces policy, we do it through budgets, through fall economic statements, and through legislation in this House. Considering that there is no legislation, to, as, as the member described, tells you this isn't coming out of left field, this is craziness coming out of right field. Mr. Speaker, again, I have suggested in a few cases. Member from Chatham, come to order. Seven hundred million dollars in one hour was the was the cost to go of, of, of a washout in Burlington of eight meters of track. Do you know how many hundreds of millions of dollars it's cost us to replace the operating rooms, not once, but twice in the last 24 months at Burlington Hospital? Do you want to talk to Mayor Goldring about the impacts of climate change on his stormwater system? Would you like to go to Buffalo and try to explain Answer. unprecedented water system? Maybe you would like to talk to the people in Toledo, Mr. Speaker, in Toledo, 400,000. Thank you. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Let's speak of a question to the Minister of uh, Education. Uh, Minister, by now everyone knows you tried to sneak a half a billion dollars in cuts to the education system past Ontarians. Uh, but what we don't know is which schools you will close to make those cuts. There are over 150 accommodations underway. You repeatedly mentioned 600 schools that are close to empty across the province, most of them in rural and small town Ontario. You have said, quote, it's not prudent fiscal management to keep turning on lights and heating for schools that are not operating at capacity, end of quote. So well, Minister, are you going to turn the lights off and the heating off in those 600 schools? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I, I caught a whiff of trying to hide things there. First, uh, in his, in his uh, response, I want to read you what the Auditor General said, Speaker. The The member from Stormont, come to order. Please finish. What the Auditor General said last week was that they had a request at the Member Standing from Renfrew, Committee Pembroke, Council, come to come to order a second time. To look at whether the government's communication of a $2 billion savings associated with the negotiations with school board employees' collective agreements was reasonable. I'm quoting the auditor. As you saw in our press release and from our report, we have concluded that the estimate was reasonable. Answer. Quite frankly, everything we did during those negotiations was accurate, what we reported to the Thank public, you. and totally transparent. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not really uh, calling into question the, uh, the work of the auditor. I'm calling into the question the sneakiness of this government by cutting half a billion dollars from school boards, saying uh, in the past that it was always up to school boards to make decisions whether schools would stay open or closed. But you are basically closing up to 600 schools across this province, and you won't be forthright and open about it. You talk about op open government. Now, you know the 600 schools. We want to see the list, and we want to know, for the sake of our small towns, our rural Ontario and our cities, which schools are you going to close, which schools are you going to force school boards to close by depriving them of $500 million because of your fiscal mismanagement for the last 11 years? Yes, thank you, Speaker. And I'm really not sure where it is that you decide something is sneaky when you send a consultation document to every of all of 72 school boards in the province. That's not sneaky. That's open and transparent. But to respond to the question, Speaker, we have provided $22.5 billion in operating funding to school board that, this year. That's up 56.5% since 2003. That's an increase of over $4,200 for each and every student in the province of Ontario. We have dramatically increased funding, but it is also true that enrollment is Answer. declining and boards need to manage their assets. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, let me get this straight. You're still saying that boards need to manage their assets, but you're taking 500 million dollars, half a billion dollars away from those very school boards, and you're talking in this house and you talk outside about low birth rates, 
close to 600 schools, uh, not at uh, full capacity. They're less than 66 uh, percent. Um, you've basically you've, you've talked about a secret list that you have that you won't show us. Uh, I, I would think that school boards are getting the hint pretty loud and clear that they have to close schools. Now, why don't you fess up to the fact? And take the responsibility. You're forcing these schools to close. Many of these schools. Member from Glengarry, come to order. Community. I thought you would at least say something about hubs, because you have talked about community hubs. But it sounds like you've even moved away from that. So, what schools are you going to close, Minister? Thank you, Minister. Actually, I have significant funding in my budget to address community hubs, and we're currently working with. Uh, with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs to figure out just exactly what we need to do with school hubs and a number of other uh, issues. But to go back to... A member from Simcoe North, come to order. To go back to the uh, question at hand, of course we need to talk to boards about appropriate savings. This isn't about cuts. This is making sure that in a context... In a context of having a lot of underutilized capacity that boards actually review carefully their assets. But I think it's also important to note, Speaker, that we have actually provided Answer. additional funding this year for rural and remote schools, so that in those cases where you've got a, a, a rural or remote northern school that clearly has to remain open, we've actually provided additional funding. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. On November 24, 1989, the leader of the federal NDP rose in the House of Commons to propose that child poverty be eliminated within 10 years. Today, 25 years later, since that historic NDP motion, a staggering number of children, over a half a million, are living in poverty in Ontario. That's more than the population of Hamilton. It's enough to fill the Rogers Centre ten times over. To the acting premier, after a decade of Liberal government, why are a half a million children living in poverty in Ontario right here, right now? Thank you. Acting premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Child poverty is of concern for us all. Mind you, uh, we've made investments. We recognize how important it is. That's why since uh, uh, since we've invested over a billion dollars, we recognize that more needs to be done, and it will be critical for us to do so. But I do want to comment on at, at the question and from from the third party, no less. The NDP's platform didn't even mention it once in their platform. Poverty was non-existent. They voted against the very measures that was progressive in this budget that dealt with dealing with poverty. They voted against the increases for families. They voted against investments in housing and benefits for low income. They voted against higher minimum wage, Mr. Speaker. And now they have the audacity to stand here and ask us questions about something that they didn't even support. I'll leave the supplementary to my colleague who will address the very nature of what we're putting forward. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, Speaker. In 2008, the Liberal government promised to reduce child poverty by 25 per cent. The Deputy Premier called it achievable. But the Liberals failed to keep that promise to the most vulnerable kids in our province. Instead of reducing child po poverty, it's actually on the rise. 10,000 more children fell into poverty in just the last two years alone in Toronto. If the Liberals promised to break the cycle of child poverty, why is it getting worse? Minister of Children and Youth Services, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Speaker. So first, I want to thank Campaign 2000 for their thoughtful uh, report that was recently uh, released. And um, I think we all agree, Speaker, that to address poverty and help everybody reach their full potential, we need to make sure the right supports are in place. So we have recommitted to reducing poverty among children and youth through targeted investments and supports and reducing child poverty by 25 percent so everyone can get the best start in life and reach uh, success. We will be investing $15 billion funding for children's social services and more than $1 billion in the Ontario Child Benefit. I may add, by you know, no help from the NDP in indexing that to inflation, which happened with their budget, as uh, said by the Acting Premier. Uh, Answer. 
there is nothing in, in the NDP platform about poverty, but we are committed to the poverty reduction strategy, focusing on the welfare of children, housing, and uh, other important measures. Thank you. Supplementary. In her maiden speech to this House, the Premier said, I've never known poverty. Speaker, every child in this province, in this country, should be able to say the exact same thing. But today, one in five kids in our province, half a million, are living in poverty. The Liberal government has failed to meet its poverty reduction target, and child poverty is actually increasing right here in Toronto. After a decade of Liberal government, why do a half a million kids in Ontario still know all too well the pain and suffering of poverty and what it means to live in poverty here in Ontario? Thank you. Minister? So, Speaker, there's no doubt there is much more work to do on this file, uh, but we need to keep working and investing to break the cycle of poverty. Uh, we have increased the, the benefit for the Ontario Child uh, Benefit and index that to inflation, as I mentioned. This benefit, Speaker, has more than doubled. The child benefit has doubled since 2008. That's fantastic. We have other programs, Speaker, such as our student nutrition program, the Minister of Education and I were recently uh, supporting initiatives on that to help school-age children get a good breakfast and start their day successfully. And we've invested uh, many more millions of dollars and will continue to do that as part of our five-year plan to Answer. student nutrition and other programs. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question. Member from Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. Well, you can't spin the lived experience of children in the province. Who's the question? My for? next question is to the Deputy Premier. To more than a half a million children living in poverty, the Liberal promises aren't worth much. The Liberals promised to reduce child poverty by 25 per cent in five years. Those five years came and went. That promise was broken. Now the Liberals said they'll keep their word, but there's no target, no time limit. The Liberals have come up with a plastic promise they can't break and which they will never keep. To the Acting Premier, why does the Liberal government have no deadline for reducing child poverty and no urgency to get this job done? Acting Premier. Minister of uh, Children and Youth Services. Mr. Minister Speaker. of Children and Youth Services. So I just want to make it perfectly clear: this is a very serious and important issue to our government. There's no doubt about that. So let's let's focus on the facts. And our poverty reduction strategy has many components. Speaker, I mentioned about the homelessness focus. We are committing to our original uh, uh, goal to reduce poverty uh, by 25 percent using 2008 as a base year. Increasing the funding to the Community Homeless Prevention Initiative by $42 million, allocating $16 million over three years to create a thousand new supportive housing spaces, committing to this is very important, providing health benefits for children and youth and low-income families such as prescription drugs, vision care, and mental health services. Investing 50 million over five years in the strategy is very important. And you know, the, the Deputy Premier has spoken before about the challenges we've faced in moving this, this uh, strategy forward, including the lack of cooperation from the federal Thank government you. and the rallies of a recession we've lived in. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Campaign 2000 says austerity has eroded the living conditions of children and their families. But the Liberals are moving full steam ahead with an austerity plan that will only make life harder. It will slash 6% from most ministries in which Bloomberg calls the biggest cut since Harris. It means a half a million dollars will be cut from our schools, hurting the most vulnerable kids the most. How can the Liberals say they're committed to addressing child poverty when their cuts are Question. already making the problems worse? Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, I mean, quite frankly, this is outrageous. The NDP did not even mention the word poverty in their platform. Not even mentioned it. They, vo they voted the most progressive budget in Ontario's history. This is what they said no to, Speaker. They said no Remember to increasing families Waterloo. who depend on the Ontario Child Benefit. They said no to investments in housing and benefits for low-income children. Shit. They said no to a higher minimum wage and much, much more. Shit. PCs didn't help either. They, they wanted to slash social services. So, there's no doubt that this government has moved on poverty reduction in Ontario. We've made investments, Speaker. There's more to do. We are deeply committed. It's a very serious issue. I'm, I'm very disappointed to hear the language being used by Answer. the Answer. 
uh, party. We should be working together to reduce child poverty and Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, there are more that more children living in poverty than there are people living in Hamilton or Niagara, wow. and that is a shameful record from a government that has made so many promises. It's a human deficit that will only hurt the province. And worst of all, the deep cutbacks will put more kids in poverty, make life harder for families already struggling to make ends meet. Will the acting premier admit that the Liberals have no target, no timeline? for reducing child poverty because they know that their cuts will only make the problems worse. Minister. Speaker, I'm not sure what part of my answer wasn't heard. We are recommitting to our original target to reduce child poverty by 25 per cent. We are increasing funding in Community Homeless Initiative by $42 million for nearly a total of $294 million per year. We're allocating $16 million over three years to create 1,000 new supportive uh, housing spaces, Speaker, and we're very much focusing on supporting Ontarians living with mental health and addiction issues. So, Speaker, I don't know what else I can say except we want to keep going. We want to continue to lift children out of poverty. We will stand behind children and their families to help them reach Member their from Hamilton potential. Mountain, come and we'll keep making the investments we need. I surely hope the opposition yes, will be with us and, and reach that goal with us together. Thank you. Thank you. Question number from Solomon Dundas and South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker, to the acting premier. Minister, your government has released a new poverty reduction strategy after missing most of the targets in your last one. You keep putting obstacles in front of Ontarians struggling to do better by depriving working parent, parents of affordable local trusted childcare, by making it more difficult to get training and to enter a trade, and by driving up hydro bills, pushing more Ontarians into poverty. According to Campaign 2000's latest report card, income supports that are directly intended for children continue to be deducted from social assistance incomes, leading families no further ahead. Minister, when will your cabinet stop giving on one hand and taking away on the other? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the first question, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate and thank Campaign 2000 for their very thoughtful and constructive report. We all agree that child poverty is an issue. We need to address it. We are recommitting our efforts to doing so. We put it in the budget. We reinforce it in our fall economic statement. And, Mr. Speaker, to have this question now come from the PCs is bizarre. They, they promote and they are, they are working and they campaign on slashing social services to the most vulnerable people in our society. They voted against the Ontario Child Order. Benefit. They voted against minimum wage increase. They voted for tax cuts for low income, Mr. Speaker. And they the, uh, the, the member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. The member from uh, Prince Edward Hastings come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville come to order. And I have a few other in my head. Thank you. We all want to break that cycle of poverty. Wrap up. We want to ensure that we invest in social housing, which they also have voted against. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, supplementary. Thank you. Back to the acting premier. Many agencies and community groups who assist needy Ontarians reached out to me recently, highlighting how their funding had not seen any increases for over five years and that their clients were struggling to access services in rural Ontario, pay their hydro Member for Beaches East York, come to order, order, and get training and also in your seat come to order. Funding. More Ontarians would be in full-time work if businesses weren't being driven away. Housing would be more affordable if Ontarians could afford winter heat. And more families would boost their incomes if they could access affordable local child care. Why does this government insist on making the poor poorer and feeding them with empty promises? Minister of Children and Youth Services, Mr. Speaker. So I, I hope the PCs agree, Speaker, that poverty is a complex issue. We have, of course, limited Member resources, so we have to make the best investments possible. So that's what our, re our reduction strategy is all about: getting the best possible results for people who are in poverty. We want to lift people out of uh, poverty, but you know. 
I, I guess I'm glad the PCs have asked this question because, you know, after the election this year, I stood and announced the increase to the Ontario Child Benefit. We passed that by regulation. But guess what, Speaker? The, the in indexing to inflation was tied to the budget, and they were nowhere to be found. They were nowhere to be found. And let's look at past record. The PCs slashed yes, social assistance payments by 22 per cent when they were in power, froze ODSP payments for the minimum wage for nine years. Thank you. And the construction of all. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Un grand an end to the cuts and privatization schemes that are eroding our public health care system under this Liberal government. Just a day earlier, Health Quality Ontario revealed that when it comes to seeing a physician when we get sick, Ontario has the worst performance of all 10 countries they compare to, including Britain and the U.S. Two-thirds of patients with mental illness never get their one-week follow-up after hospitalization, and the most frail seniors in our province wait an average of 111 days for the long-term care they need. How can the Minister of Health defend his government cuts in privatization of health care when Ontarians deserve so much better? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm not exactly sure which question you're asking. The member from the third party, there's, it was a pretty broad uh, statement that was made. But I'm going to start with the uh, demonstration on the front lawn of the legislature on Friday. Uh, and um, organized primarily by the Ontario Health Coalition. Well, I was in a cabinet, a joint cabinet ministry, uh, a meeting with the uh, Quebec uh, cabinet. I had actually looked forward to uh, to meeting with the individuals on the front lawn. Unfortunately, when I returned from that cabinet meeting, I, they were no longer uh, present. But I want to reassure, reassure Ontarians that, in fact, as we continue this process of moving certain low-risk procedures into the community closer to home where people want them, uh, we do that in a, in a manner yes, that's safe and accountable and transparent, Mr. Speaker. We only do it uh, into organizations that are not-for-profit entities, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Well, Speaker, at the heart of our public health care system is the belief that high-quality care will be there for us when we need it. But too many Ontarians are waiting for months on end for the care they need and sometimes not getting it at all. And this government's prescription is a freeze on hospital funding, privatizations of our health care services, and massive cuts to home care in areas like Windsor. The minister tries to deny the reality, but patients are feeling the pain. My question is simple. When will the minister get the message, stop the cuts, and the privatizations that are undermining patient care in Ontario. Thank you, Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, what the member opposite is saying is just not true. We've, uh, for our hospitals in this province, we have uh, approximately doubled the funding to our hospitals across this province in the last 10 years. The member opposite talked about cuts in Windsor. That's simply not true. In fact, we've nearly doubled the funding to our CCAC for home care in Windsor-Essex. In fact, we increased their funding by $3 million this year compared to last year. So it's important, Mr. Speaker, that we, uh, all of us, that we are accountable for what we say and we speak to the facts and we don't make things up as we go along. And it's, you know, the important thing I'd like to leave with Ontarians is that we are investing in health care. We have one of the best health care systems in the world, Mr. Speaker. There is more work to be done. And we're making that work carefully in a calculated manner with our stakeholders in a way which is going to continue to improve the quality. Thank you. Your question, the member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, climate change is one of the most important issues of our time, and governments, industry, communities, and individuals must work together to solve this serious problem. I know that this is a significant issue for my constituents in Halton. In fact, a survey of Halton Region shows that close to 83 per cent of residents are concerned about climate change. Halton residents want our government to take the necessary steps to ensure that Ontario reduces its greenhouse gas emissions. 
I'm pleased to see that our government continues to take decisive action to address this serious challenge to our environment. It will help fight the severe weather that we've been facing recently. And taking these steps will also ensure that future generations will be able to breathe more easily Question. and live healthy lives tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change please update the House on what our government is doing with other jurisdictions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've done quite a lot. I, I, I've often given credit to my uh, friend uh, from St. Catharines. Uh, if you think about Ontario today, we have a blue box recycling program as, uh, as a result of this government and his work, and we have, uh, we have no more yellow hazy fogs over Toronto anymore because our coal plants are closed, Mr. Speaker. And every time we went through those, folks opposite produce that these kind of environmental measures would cost people money and would, would produce doom and gloom and economic downturn. What we actually know is that Ontarians are very proud, and we are a party with the courage to make tough decisions. But we're not alone, Mr. Speaker. We're working very closely with Quebec, who have taken some very, some very important initiatives to capture the green economy and lower GHG emissions, and I'll look forward on the supplementary answer. continuing to answer, Mr. Speaker. Thanks. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, my question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. I'm pleased to hear that our government is working with other provinces to provide leadership on climate change where the federal government is actually failing to take meaningful action. It's important that Ontarians come together to act on climate change now. It's vital that we recognize the unique opportunity our province has to become a global leader on this issue. The Toronto Stock Exchange and the TSX Venture Exchange already include more clean technology renewable companies than any other exchange in the world. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that a number of these forward-thinking environment companies are actually in my own riding. I'm sure my constituents will be happy to know that we're working with partners in other jurisdictions to combat climate change. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the Question. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change please share with the House what areas of action Ontario and Quebec will be taking Thank under you. the Memorandum of Understanding? Minister of the Environment. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So, what we're doing with Quebec, uh, with California, with New York, with the Reggie, Reggie states, which the opposition reads as taxes, is actually quite the opposite, Mr. Speaker. What we're actually looking at is this: Will we buy electric, carbon-neutral cars made in Ontario and made in North America, or are we going to buy them solely from China? If we do not have the partnerships with Quebec, California, New York, Michigan, to create that green supply chain, to put the market mechanisms in place, to change our fiscal policies that companies like those in your constituency that want to innovate and go from a high carbon, low productivity economy to a high productivity economy that is a low carbon economy, we need to change the way we manage trade and we manage fiscal policy and those kinds of outcomes. Mr. Speaker, John Kerry, the Secretary of the States, identified that while the tech boom was a $1 yes, trillion dollar expansion of our economy, the low-carbon economy over the next 20 years will be a $6 trillion dollar expansion of the economy. Thank and we you. in Ontario are, are committed to lead that transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister, last week motorists along the QEW got a glimpse of your vision for winter maintenance as they attempted to maneuver through snow-covered, slippery roads and multi-vehicle accidents. I'm sure many of them wondered where their government was to ensure road safety and how it was that the Minister of Transportation was unprepared for a snowstorm everyone else saw coming. I don't know if you get briefed on the weather, Minister, but given the direct relationship between foul weather and poor driving conditions, you may want to check into weather the new weather app at weather the Blackberry weather. store. Minister, given that you were caught flat-footed last week, will you commit to the House today to keeping yourself apprised of the five-day weather forecast going forward? <laughs> Good question. Minister of Transportation. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for that question. Of course, as I've said many, many times in this legislature, uh, road safety and highway safety is one of the most important responsibilities that I have. And with respect specifically to winter maintenance, the fact that we uh, that uh, the, the road safety is such a priority for us is one of the reasons that we have dedicated more resources this year to make sure that right across the province of Ontario, uh, we are in a position to respond. Uh, to the weather as it occurs. In fact, Speaker, not that many weeks ago, as we've discussed here in the House, I was in position to announce that we have added 50 new pieces of machinery to Southern Ontario. 
which speaker, of course, complement the additional 55 pieces of equipment that we put on the roads, mostly in northern Ontario, last year. We will continue to work very hard over the course of the rest of this winter season, Speaker, to make sure that we are equipped to deal and that we do deal with winter maintenance conditions. And I look forward to the, uh, to the supplementary so that I can respond, uh, I can respond with more information. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. Uh, Minister, we've heard all about this review as to what happened last week uh, from you last week. And I don't know if that review is in yet, but I can tell you what it might look like. It'll say three things. Minister, we live in Ontario, Canada, where it snows. Yeah. Two, it snowed. And yeah. three, <laughs> you failed to ensure you were prepared to clear that snow. A couple of weeks ago, you boasted about $15 million Deputy for winter leader. maintenance. Thing is, only just over half of that went to the actual equipment. The rest to bureaucrats and communication campaigns. No. That's typical. If That's last typical. week proved anything, it's that we need plows and salters on our roads, not more bureaucracy. Of the $8 million that was spent on equipment, Minister, can you tell us if those plows are actually operational today? Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member for, uh, for the follow-up question. And I said, in my, I said in my initial response, Speaker, that the road safety is so important for us. It is why we have brought more resources to bear to make sure that we're equipped to deal with winter conditions, Speaker. There's one thing that I can suggest the people of Ontario, certainly the people of the Kitchener-Waterloo region, don't want. I would suggest, Speaker, is that that member use sarcasm to try and make the point in this legislature when we're dealing with an issue that's so important, Speaker. It's so important to make sure that we are in a position to deal with winter conditions. It's why we're investing more resources. I do have a right to hear the answer. Please finish. Hey, Speaker, it's one of the reasons that we've provided additional briefings for members of all three caucuses to make sure that everyone is very well apprised of what we are doing this year to deal with the conditions. It's why we've added more equipment. It's why we've added more inspectors, Speaker. And I know that over the coming weeks and months, we'll continue to do, from the ministry's perspective, the best yes, job sir. we can to make sure that our roads and highways remain as they've been for the last 13 years amongst the safest in North America. Thanks Thank very you. much, Mr. Speaker. Question to member from Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. A report to re release this afternoon shows that the WSIB is handing out huge safety rebates to companies that have been convicted of health and safety violations. Some of these violations have even resulted in workplace deaths. In many cases, the companies were fined for their violations, but the fines were nothing compared to the generous re WSIB rebates. The government has known about this problem with this program for many years, yet millions of dollars, millions of dollars are still being sent to employers guilty of serious violations. Will the government scrap the destructive experience rating program now? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. I do want to thank the, uh, the member for this important question, and it is a very important question. Um, I want to start by saying this is a conversation that's, been, that's included in this report. At the basis, the foundation of this report is that people were killed on the job. We can't lose, we can't lose sight of that. I want to thank Mr. Ryan. I want to thank Ms. Hardwick of the OFL for the courtesy of some advanced knowledge on this report. Okay. It's something I take very, very seriously, Speaker. All three parties have used experience rating. It was brought in since the 1980s. But what is important, Speaker, is that we do right by these families, by the families, by the survivors of people who have died on the job. There obviously are some existing problems with the current system, and that includes the, experiencing, uh, the, the experience rating system. The WSIB has been acting already to improve the system. It made one change in 2008 that was implemented in 2009. Answer. We're in a period of consultation, Speaker, on this issue, and I urge the member to make sure he's involved in that consultation. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, with due respect, there is nothing more to study. The respected Arthur Report, which was delivered to the government in early 2012, said the government should scrap, said the government should scrap the program unless it could be proven that it was doing more good than harm. This is a program where a company like Triple M Metals, where a worker was killed, in 2009, after he was trapped inside a metal shredder, 
was given more than $926,000 in safety rebates in 2011-2012. It's time to stop studying and start acting. Would this government commit to ending this outrageous, this Question. outrageous program now? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And I do want to thank the member for the supplementary. As I said, this is a very important issue, and we take it very, very seriously. The policy that is in place now, if a company is responsible for a traumatic, for a traumatic workplace fatality, it can't get a rebate in the year that that fatality occurred. Since 2009, we've got $11 million in rebates to employees that have been cancelled as a result of that. The WSIB knows that there's more work to do. Than it. It's in the process of making changes. Earlier this year, we released a report on the framework for the costs as we move ahead, Speaker. It's focused on potential reforms to employer classifications, to rate setting, and Speaker, to experience rating. We've completed one round of consultation, or the WSIB has. We'll be taking further proposals out for change. I look forward to seeing the results of that consultation. Yeah, I want to hear from the OFL. From I want Waterloo. to hear from employers in this regard. And, Speaker, I want to hear from the opposition Thank parties you. in this regard. Good Thank question. you. The member from Barrie. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, in my constituency of Barrie, there is a great representation from the members of the Aboriginal community. The Ministry of Community and Social Services is responsible for providing culturally appropriate programs and services to the Aboriginal peoples. As you know, First Nations and Métis peoples seek services according to the needs of their community and delivered in their own communities. Minister, can you tell us what support the government and your ministry are providing to Aboriginal peoples in need? Thank you, Minister of Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie for that question. Supporting First Nations and Meti people in their communities is a very important priority for our government and for my ministry. Last week, I was in the great city of Thunder Bay celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Aboriginal Health and Wellness Strategy known as OZ. In the early 1990s, we came together, government, First Nations, Meti, and Aboriginal leaders, to recognize and work together to address the concerns of Aboriginal communities. With the partnership of the OZ strategy in 1990, we began funding organizations to address the high levels of family violence and poor health among Ontario's Aboriginal people and communities. Partnership and collaboration has led to the wide network of culturally appropriate programs and services that exist today. It has also created 650 jobs Answer. to deliver healing, health and wellness programs in 250 Aboriginal communities and established 460 community-based pro projects across Thank you. Ontario. New Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. This government has made building supports for Aborig Aboriginal peoples a priority. However, as we all know, there are many examples of First Nation communities facing crises of mental illness, addiction, and suicide. Also, Aboriginal women and girls are disappropriately victims of violence and poverty in Canada. This very important issue has been compounded by the fact that the federal government has been neglecting its responsibility to support this vulnerable population. Last week, we received disappointing news from Ottawa. It was reported that the status of women in Canada, the federal agency that is supposed to promote the equality and advancement of women, has funded 210 projects since the fall of 200, 2011, and only 31 of them have had focus on Aboriginal groups. Question. That's just 14.8 per cent of the agency's entire programming targeting this hugely vulnerable group. Minister, what is our government doing to Thank assist you. these women and girls? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, Aboriginal peoples and communities do face unique challenges. There are high rates of violence against Aboriginal women, substance abuse, and youth suicides. That is why our government, as announced last week, is investing more than $10 million to help reduce family violence and violence against Aboriginal women and children and improve healing, health, and wellness in Aboriginal communities across Ontario. A large part of the money, some $8.6 million, will expand the reach of all 
laws services to the growing Aboriginal population and to hard-to-reach communities. Specifically, this will fund Talk for Healing, a phone helpline for Aboriginal women and girls in the north who have limited access to services. I had the privilege of seeing the work being done there firsthand last week while in Thunder Bay. These investments affirm Ontario's ongoing commitment Answer. and support to the work of the Aboriginal Healing and Wellness Strategy. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Houston. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Minister of Education. Minister, your party's policy on student transportation is failing. It's failing to lower costs for school boards. The Ottawa Student Transportation Alliance was whacked with a 17 per cent increase in transportation costs this year by one of the consortiums approved by your RFP process. Independent operators received only a 2 per cent increase. Minister, the courts have ruled in favour of small independent operators like Montgomery and Richmond's and Foley's and Boldrick's in my riding six times already, but you continue to drag out this process. Minister, will you commit to suspending an RFP process that's only accomplishing two things, driving small businesses out of business and driving up costs for the local school boards? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I think, first of all, we do need to understand that the uh, funding for transportation has increased quite significantly since 2003. Yep. We've actually increased the transportation funding, Speaker, by 40 per cent. By over $880 million. We do make allowances for things like uh, uh, increases in the cost of gasoline on a regular basis. That's part of my annual funding adjustment. So the idea that somehow we have not increased the funding for transportation is just simply not accurate. So we, so we will continue doing that. It is a requirement. Answer. It is a requirement that every board, uh, in procuring any service, whether it be busing or any other service, follow the broader public sector procurement Thank you. guidelines. Supplementary. Minister, you missed the premise of the entire question. You need to spend more on transportation because you're ending competition in the school bus sector right now. That's why you have to increase spending on transportation. We have small businesses that are going out of business in the province of Ontario because of your flawed RFP process, and the courts have proven this six times, yet you continue to drag them through the mud and they continue to surround your office and any time you appear with big yellow school buses. For too long, the RFP process has been costing jobs at small offices and now we find it's wreaking havoc with the school boards as well. School boards that were part of the pilot RFP in 2010 in Northern Ontario are now experiencing deficits and labour problems as they drive up the transportation costs there. Small operators who'd been in business as family Question. for generations are out of business. So, Minister, the process has proven to be a disaster. Will you commit to suspending the RFP while an independent third party review is done and one that's not stacked Thank against you. the independent school bus? Yes, and in fact, we did make a commitment during the campaign that we would conduct an independent, um, an independent review of competitive procurement. We have, in fact, uh, we have, in fact, uh, set up the panel to do that. It is led by Mr. Justice Colin Campbell, who I think any of you who know Mr. Campbell's uh, reputation as a as an Ontario judge would agree that that is a third party independent review when it's being led by Mr. Justice Colin Campbell. He has begun his work. He will be reporting back to me uh, after consulting with the various stakeholders, That's the various Very bus reasonable. operators, there's more than one association, the school boards, the yes, consortiums. Sir. So I look forward to receiving Mr. Justice Campbell's report. Thank, Thank you. you. New question. The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, the most recent Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation report on housing trends lists my community of London as the second hardest community for immigrants to find security in, ho in the housing security in the country. Second only to Toronto, even though Toronto's population is 90% larger than London's. 
Much of this trend is due to the lack of affordability. However, we know the real issue at play is access for newcomers. Newly arrived, newly arrived individuals and families are finding it difficult to secure housing because of lease restrictions. Speaker, immigrants are vital to the economic well-being and growth of our communities, especially in my riding of London. Speaker, what is this government doing to Question. ensure that newcomers in my community have the housing security they need? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the question. There's no uh, doubt at all that uh, those immigrating to this uh, province and this country have built this uh, great <coughs> province and this great country into what it is today, and that we need to do everything we can to, uh, to assist uh, everybody in Ontario to be adequately housed. Uh, as you, as, as the member may, may be interested in, in learning, I'm doing a Building Bridges tour. I'm touring and speaking to a number of groups concerned about uh, housing options. We were up to Ottawa last week to talk to the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Corporation. We have a couple of housing groups coming in today. I'm meeting with groups concerned about immigrant housing and other housing, and we hope to uh, renew our answer. Answer. We hope to renew our long-term housing strategy in ways that will more effectively deal with the very kinds of concerns the honourable member has raised. Supplementary. Speaker, especially in Western Ontario, we need a diverse workforce in order to kickstart the economic engine. But it's not just in my community of London. Immigrants in Toronto have it worse. Over 36% are unable to secure affordable housing. And right across the province, it's the same in Windsor and Hamilton. Speaker, we want assurances. Will this government give? We want assurances that this government will give us, of the people of Ontario, and not just take this study that identifies a problem and it just won't be ignored. And what is this government going to do to find solutions for the housing security that are faced by the immigrants in Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, we're going to do anything and everything we can to address the housing challenges that we have uh, in the province, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and we have, actually. Um, we, uh, we have been meeting with uh, groups. We're looking uh, uh, particularly at uh, partnering with the private sector, who we think uh, brings a lot of expertise uh, to the table. We need to find some creative entrepreneurial ways uh, of doing that. Uh, the in investment in affordable housing program, which we're jointly engaged in with the feds, is helpful. $800 million allocation there. Uh, that's handled through municipal service partners, by the way, so that local municipalities can determine for themselves uh, the best approach. We've also re reinvested in the CHIPI program, yes, which again is, is, uh, is managed uh, by municipalities so as to reflect the local needs. Thank you. New question. Member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. November is Diabetes Month in Canada. The Canadian Diabetes Association is a remarkable advocate for people with diabetes. I know we have many representatives here today in the gallery. Thank you to the volunteers and staff for all that you do. As a nurse, I know that diabetes is a chronic disease that can cause serious complications if not managed properly. I provided care in and out of the hospital for many diabetics over my career. It's estimated there's nearly 1.4 million people in Ontario who have been diagnosed with diabetes. That's nearly 10% of the population. By 2020, it's estimated that the number of people living with diabetes will reach almost 2 million, with an estimated cost of $7 billion to the health care system. Question. Speaker, it concerns many of my former patients in Cambridge. What is our government doing to help these uh, with diabetes, Minister? Thank you. Minister of Health Long-Term Care. Thank you. thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Cambridge uh, for raising this very important question. Mr. Speaker, we've come a long way in diabetes prevention, treatment, and management. I remember when my sister was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when she was in her teens more than 40 years ago, and just the changes that have taken place in this province and around the world, it's something we can all be proud of. And Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to providing Ontarians who have diabetes with the information and supports that they need to manage their health effectively. And I'm proud that, in fact, under our government, every single Ontarian with diabetes who wants a family doctor 
has one. And Mr. Speaker, the best way to fight diabetes is to prevent it. And that's why our government is moving forward to put in place recommendations from our Healthy Kids panel to help us undertake that's the right. challenge of reducing childhood obesity, which contributes to chronic diseases like diabetes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Speaker, there are no known ways to prevent type 1 diabetes, but research shows that type 2 diabetes can be delayed or prevented through healthy eating, weight management, and exercise. Both types of diabetes can be managed to result in better health outcomes. One way is through the is use of insulin pumps. A nursing colleague of mine was pleased that Ontario was the first province to fully fund insulin pumps for children and adults for type 1 diabetes. This saved her up to $18,300 in the first five years as her son was an insulin-dependent diabetic. So far, the programs provided more than 15,000 Ontarians and many of my constituents, including seniors, with funding for the purchase of insulin pumps and related Question. supplies. Minister, what is Ontario doing to help those with complex needs? Thank you, Minister. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that uh, the health needs of Ontarians with diabetes are often very complex and require multidisciplinary care, which is why we've established six different centres for complex diabetes care. And these centres have provided care to more than 6,000 new patients. But we've also increased the number of diabetes education teams to more than 300 around the province to help people manage their diabetes and their related complications. We've also invested in self-management, providing workshops to more than 14,000 individuals. And on the insulin pump, Mr. Speaker, which is now provided, uh, I'm proud to say that the member who just reminded me, the member from Th Thunder Bay Superior, introduced not one but two private members' bills specifically speaking to that issue of the importance of providing those insulin pumps. It's a beautiful example, yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, of how technology has evolved in the government as a part of our responsibility to diabetes treatment and management. We've responded as well. Thank you. New question. Member from uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of uh, Training, Colleges and Universities. Uh, Minister, in July, I gave you a, a personal invitation uh, to tour uh, Kempville College, and although you didn't have the courtesy to include me in your tour recently, at least you showed up and uh, saw the facilities at that college. At the facilities that uh, I think are state of the art for our agriculture students, and also provide a wonderful venue to host a number of community events. These events bring in critical revenue and let everyone know that Kemple College is open for business. So you can appreciate my surprise when I found out last week that the University of Guelph has stopped allowing uh, private bookings at the campus effective November 30th. Come on. Minister, so many people, including your provincial facilitator, Question. are working on a sustainable future for the college. Why are you allowing the University of Guelph to undermine those efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to begin by thanking the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, the officials of the Chem Table College and also the leaders of the community, along with my, my colleague, Minister Jeff Leal. And we extended, actually, an uh, invitation to the member to join us, but unfortunately, his schedule didn't allow, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's very important for our government to make sure that uh, our young people in eastern Ontario, they have access to agriculture education, quality agriculture Agriculture education, Mr. Speaker, in this wonderful facility. We are working with the community leaders, Mr. Speaker, and as well as the, uh, the institution itself to make sure that Campbell Rock College will continue to provide uh, educational uh, uh, services to uh, young people in the, in the eastern part of the Answer. province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. <laughs> Minister, it's obvious that you don't know what's going on that campus. I tried to send a booking for a meeting at that campus, and I know there's other uh, groups that have tried to book uh, meetings, uh, events in that, uh, on that campus, and the college, uh, the university, has said no. It's a pattern that began with the University of Guelph when they announced the closure in March. They timed it to ensure that we wouldn't get a new intake of students. Minister, I believe Kempel College has a bright future. And if you agree, you get on the phone and tell the university to stop blocking the community from providing revenue at that facility. Guelph has done enough Minister damage education. to this community. Will you join me in stepping in and stopping this right now? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, as I said earlier, it's very important for this government to make sure that uh, our young people in eastern Ontario, they have access to the quality education in agriculture. Actually, when this issue came up, Mr. Speaker, our government, through the Ministry of Agri-Food, we, uh, we committed to $2 million investments to maintain the program and continue in, the, in, the, in Chemical College. And as I said earlier, again, Mr. Speaker, we had the honour and pleasure of meeting the officials of the college and also the uh, leaders of the community last October to make Make sure that uh, uh, the college uh, and also the community finds a, a solution to the issue which uh, the college is facing in, in the local community. And they are working very hard, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that uh, this college will continue its operation with the assistance of the community leaders in the, uh, on, on site, Mr. Answer. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, since we came to the office, we have invested heavily in public in in, in, in post-secondary education. Actually, we have increased funding by 83 percent for our young people to be able to study in our university. New question: The member from Bramley Gore Thank you Very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Any real plan to address child poverty must address the problem of precarious work. When the federal government pledged to eradicate child poverty in 1989. 13 per cent of the country had precarious employment. By 2007, the figure had ballooned to almost 21 per cent. Now, currently in the GTA, precarious work has increased by almost 50 per cent over the past two decades. Most of that growth has occurred under this government. This government must take precarious employment and particularly temporary work through temporary help agencies seriously. Families are struggling to make ends meet. Children are living in poverty as a result of precarious employment. Will this government commit to a real plan Question. to address precarious employment? Will this government address this issue so that children will not live in poverty? Thank you. Minister of Labour, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the question. I think it's something that concerns us all in the province of Ontario. I think we all know that the world of work has changed in this, this, uh, in this province, and uh, the Ministry of Labour works really hard to ensure that Ontarians are treated with the dignity and the respect they deserve at work. Speaker, we've just passed Bill 18, which speaks to, uh, to an awful lot of the issues that the member has raised. Uh, the Employment Standards Act sets out payment of wages, minimum wage, overtime pay, all those things that treat employees that the way that we'd like to be treated as employees ourselves. If the member has any issues or if he has any specific examples of where he feels the Employment Standards Act is being abridged, please call our office, urge his constituents to call the office, and we will act upon those concerns, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. During my question today, the member from Be Beach to Seashore comment they should have elected a Liberal. Will he re Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. It's not a point of order. The member from Welland on a point of order. Correct my record from my second question. I said half a million in cuts. I really meant a half a billion in cuts. That's a uh, point of order. And any member can correct their record at any time. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.